When Nicole Nachman was late to file her application for student housing at Florida State University, she believed that she would have no place to live and decided to go down a path that would provide her with housing for the rest of her life. This is Monsters. Miriam Deans was married to her first husband, Joseph Carey Sr., in the early 80s, and she had two sons with him, Joseph Jr. and Kevin Carey. They lived together in Houston, Texas, for about 12 years before they separated. After the separation, Miriam met Ronald Nachman in January of 1993. It turns out they played volleyball together. Miriam lost her job at the beginning of April and moved in with Ronald. At this time, Joey and Kevin were living with their grandmother in Tampa, Florida. In the middle of April, Miriam found out that she was pregnant, so the couple found a rental house to move to, and on August 1, 1993, Joey and Kevin came to live with them. According to Ronald, he wasn't aware that Miriam was still married and going through a divorce until after they moved in together. The living arrangements were short-lived as he moved out on September 18th because he claimed that Miriam was abusing him. When Nicole Nachtman was born on February 11th, 1994, the living arrangement changed again. Ronald describes the situation in court. Yeah, she called me on uh, February, uh, January 31st, she called me at my home and invited me back to the birth. Okay, so you were present when Nicole was born? Yes, ma'am. And that was February of 1994, correct? Uh, that was February 11th, 1994. And that was in Texas? Yes, ma'am. And I moved back to the house. You moved back in where Nicole was living for what purpose? I, uh, Nicole and I slept in the sunroom and I took care of her every day. So even after you and Miriam Deans broke up, you all set up some type of um, caretaking schedule where you were taking care of Nicole every day as a baby? I took care of Nicole every day by myself as a baby in the sunroom. And until what age did you care for Nicole? I, I um, moved out of that house into my, my two-bedroom apartment. I had a nursery in a two-bedroom apartment and she lived with me, so we lived with me until uh, January 7th, 1995. I took care of her almost every day by myself. So she was almost a little less than a year old for the first year of her life is when you cared for her every day. Yes, ma'am. It seems that Ronald had full custody of Nicole for the first year or so, but then Miriam filed for custody and the pair began a lengthy legal battle over their daughter. It was a battle that Ronald would ultimately lose and after the age of four and a half years old, he would have no contact with Nicole. The prosecution pointed out that Ronald had previously stated that he didn't have any conflict with Miriam, as well as the fact that he had another daughter that he hadn't seen since she was six years old, a fact that he didn't seem thrilled to be brought up. You've actually previously said that there was no conflict between you and Miriam Deans, correct? We had no conflict, ma'am. There was no war between you and Miriam Deans, right? In our family system, Mom, Miriam, Dad, Ron, and our daughter, Nicole, we had no conflict. But I'm asking no between you and Miriam, you've previously said that there was no conflict between you and her, correct? In our family system, we had no conflict, ma'am. And Mr. Nachman, it's accurate that you have another child that you haven't had any contact with since she was six years old, correct? Is that correct? I have a sole custody of one child, another child. But you've had no contact with her since she was six years old, correct? It's a yes or no question. Uh, that would be true. Eventually, Miriam left Texas and stayed with family in Tampa for a short while, but then decided to move to Virginia. Joey, who would have been around 17 by this time, didn't want to go, so he ran away and lived with his grandmother until he graduated high school and then joined the United States Air Force. Did there come a time when you stopped uh, living with your mother and stayed uh, and stayed with your grandmother? Yes. How old was Nicole at that time? Let's see, I went to uh, high school in Tampa um, in around 96, 97, so my sister was probably three or four. 
Okay, so three or four years old, um, you chose while you were in high school to live, stay in Tampa. Why, why, what was the reason behind that? So after, without too much background, I guess, but after the mess that I called Houston when we were in the living condition there with my dad and everything, uh, we finally were able to leave that place and my sister's uh, biological father. The legal mess that we were in, the problems we had there, and when we finally got back to where all my family was, and I felt a lot better being back here, um, my mom wanted to immediately go back to Virginia where she owned a house. And to me, that was just a huge mistake. And it was just kind of getting away from our foundation of family and being together and helping each other out. So I just immediately thought it was going to be a mess again. So I wanted to stay where I was happy. Okay, so you were happy here in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And you were happy in high school. Yes. And you didn't want to leave. No. So you chose, and your, and your grandmother was okay with you living with her? Yes. At some point, Miriam met and married Robert Deans, and the couple, with Nicole and Kevin, settled in Tampa. After a few years, Kevin also graduated and joined the military. Kevin tragically died in a car accident about a year later in 2003. Once Nicole graduated high school, she began attending Florida State University in Tallahassee, initially working toward a degree in history, but eventually changing her major to public relations. Her dorm roommate from her freshman year testified that Nicole had told her there was no future in history. She completed her freshman year in the summer of 2015 and was back living with her mother and stepfather during the summer break. She had also visited her brother Joey that summer. Now, when you would visit um, uh, Nicole, did um, with the mom, with your mom, did everything seem normal? Did you see any sort of fighting or loud arguing when you were there? Uh, between who? Say that again. Just the family. Did you see any strife or anything that caused you concern? No, nothing that caused concern. No. In the summer of uh, 2015, did you see Nicole at all that summer? Yes. Or when did you see her? The summer, where, uh, after, right before the incident. Um, what, uh, did you see her here in Tampa or where, or where was she? No, I was living in uh, Washington State. She visited me out there. Now, were you already married by then? Yes. And you already had your kids? Yes. Okay. And um, how long did she stay with you that summer of 2015? Uh, three weeks to a month, somewhere in that area. While she was there that summer of 2015, did she ever discuss any issues with you about your mom? Nothing out of the ordinary. Okay. Nothing just typical. Did she ever mention to you that she was concerned about your mom or concerned about their relationship or anything that she was worried about? No. Did, um, did she ever discuss with you any issues at school or things that were going on at school, problems she was dealing with at school? I mean, uh... On that specific visit, I don't remember typical, typical problems, you know, bullying or whatever. Okay, so she didn't, she did confide in some things, but anything that caused you alarm or concern at that point? No. And what was your understanding as to where she would be going in the fall? Uh, Florida State University. Was that the last time you saw Nicole Nottingham before the sun sites? Yes. Nicole turned in her application for student housing at FSU late and was told that there were no spaces left in the dorms. This was a problem because Tallahassee was at least a four-hour drive from Tampa, which meant commuting wasn't an option. She started implementing a new plan, but after a few days, she got a call from the school and was told that they had gotten her a spot in overflow housing. Overflow Housing was a small community area in one of the dorms that had been converted to a room with a couple of sets of bunk beds and some dressers. Students could live there temporarily until one of the permanent dorm rooms became available. This would happen because some students would inevitably not show up at the beginning of the term, giving up their spot in the dorm. The offer of a spot in Overflow Housing required a $100 fee. Nicole didn't have $100, so on August 19th, she called her cousin, David Lear, who lived nearby, and asked if she could borrow the money. Um, I was at work, and uh, I guess um, uh, sometime in the morning, uh, she had called me, so um, I, I was too busy to get the phone, so I, uh, after the call was over, I texted her, and I told her um, that I'm at work, that I'm busy, um, you, know, what, you know, what's going on. 
And then she texted me, um, she wanted to know if she could talk to me or whatever. And then I said, okay. I said, how about after work? And she said, fine. And that was, that was it. Okay. So what time did you get off work that day? Uh, I imagine two o'clock. Okay. Yeah. So it's two thirty um, somewhere in there. Two or two thirty. Yeah. And did you head straight home? Oh uh, yes, I did. All right. yeah. About approximately what time did you got home? You uh, I think it was around three that day. Okay. Yeah. And did you did you call Nicole and not went back? Uh, I totally forgot to call her back. Okay. Um, you know, I just I just it slipped my mind. Uh, so as exactly um, as I was coming home, I was pulling into the driveway. The phone rang. It was her, and um, I you know. I, then I remembered that she texted me, so then I answered the phone. Okay. Um, she just asked me what I was doing, uh, if she can come by, and um, you know, I, I kind of asked her, yeah, I said, yeah, it's fine, um, what, what's going on? And then she asked me, uh, she told me something about if she could borrow money uh, for her dorm room. So I said, yeah, I, I checked my pockets, I had money on me. Did she, so, say, did she tell you how much she needed? A hundred dollars. And you had that with you? Yeah, I just happened to have it on me, so. Okay. So what did you, what did you tell her then? Um, I told her, uh, you know, I said, yeah, come on by. Um, she said she's going to come right away, so I said, okay, I'll wait in the driveway. Right, so you never even went in your house then? No, at that time, no. Right. And did she show up shortly after talking to you? Uh, she did. Like immediately, like probably about five minutes. About five minutes. Yeah. Um, and after she showed up, and how, how did she seem? Um... Just normal, her, her regular demeanor. Regular demeanor? Yeah. All right. Um, did she seem upset, crying, anything like that? Uh, no. Um, I just knew that she needed to borrow the money. So uh, she showed up, she gave me a hug, and I said, um, uh, you know, she said she needed the money, I gave it to her. Uh, I made a joke because it was a uh, state trooper um, parked next to the house. Uh, he watches over students uh, coming off the buses and stuff like that. Uh, so I made a joke that, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, I gave her a hundred bucks. It looks like a drug deal or something, you know, like it's just suspicious, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so she said, thanks. Uh, we talked about, um, she's going back to school. So then I asked her when she's coming back, uh, probably around Thanksgiving. And I said, okay, you know, basically I'll see you around Thanksgiving. And she said, okay, gave me a hug. And uh, she got back in the car and left. Okay. Classes for the fall semester of 2015 at FSU began on August 24th, so Nicole was all set to begin her sophomore year. Wesley Rowe lived next door to Bob and Miriam Deans. On August 20th, 2015, his stepdaughter, Elizabeth, had gone to an event at the high school she was about to start attending. At about 9 o'clock that night, Wesley said he was inside his house talking to Elizabeth about the information she had brought home about her upcoming school when they heard shots. It was sometime probably uh, like around 9 o'clock or so, a little bit after that. Was it already dark outside? Yeah, it was already dark outside, 9.15 or something like that. We started talking about her going to high school and what was going on, how was, you know, seeing the high school, how was it? And what, what room were you all in? I was in her bedroom. Okay. And her bedroom, when we look at these houses, look at this picture, uh, where, where in your house would she, would her bedroom be? Um, you almost can see a window there. It's like the farthest to the right. Okay. Um, are, are you referring to the, wind, the only windows you can see yeah. that are right there? Yeah, but one more over. This one here? Yeah. Okay, so that, that's her bedroom? Yes. And, and you all were in there that night? Yes. All right. What uh, what happened while you were in that room? I mean, we were speaking, and I, I'm guessing around 9.20 or maybe a little bit before then, um, we heard a pop, and then I heard a pop, pop. It almost sounded like fireworks. And I was kind of thinking maybe, you know, there were some kind of kids outside, you know, doing fireworks or goofing off or something. So I didn't know exactly what it was. Um, I basically walked out to our living room to see what was going on, and I kind of heard like a scream. Um, it wasn't a kid scream, it was kind of scream of, you know, agony or mis you know, disbelief. And next thing I saw was a shadowy figure uh, run between the two windows in our living room towards back to that lake. Okay. All right, now let me, I'm going to get into that with a, a little more uh, detail with you. So, um, 
the shots you said, you just described it as bang, and then you said there was a pause? There was a pause, and then there was two more. And were the two more, were those more rapid in succession? Yes, they were right after each other. Wesley wasn't sure what had happened, but he decided it would be best to call 911 and have them come take a look. The audio quality of the call isn't great, but it was a standard call to 911, just saying they thought something suspicious might have happened. It wasn't until Wesley hung up with 911 that he noticed that there was something in his driveway. Uh, after I, I hung up from the 911 call, I went out to uh, the front of our kind of our house inside, and, and we have some windows there. And I was looking outside the windows to see when the you know deputies or the sheriffs would arrive. So as I was looking out there. Uh, I saw something in my driveway, at the bottom of my driveway, and I couldn't figure out what it was at first. Couldn't picture what I was seeing because it was dark and there was some street lighting. Um, and then I finally figured out what I was looking at were shoes and I couldn't understand what, what are these shoes here. And then I understood that uh, there was also blue jeans and I figured out that was a body and it was facing towards the road. So at that point I was really panicking so I went and called 911 again from my cell phone. He called 911 back. Yes, I called earlier about gunshots at my house, and it looks like I'm looking out the front yard. It looks like somebody uh, at the end of our driveway got shot or something. They're like laying on the ground. What is the address of the emergency? I'm very dry. Uh, Somebody shot at the end of the driveway. Can we get a deputy here now? Yes, sir. I'm trying to enter this into the system. How long ago were the gunshots? Uh, I don't know. I called earlier. It was about four minutes before I called earlier. I think the deputy's here now. They are there. Can you see him? I think so. I don't want to go outside after that. It looks like there might be something. I can't really tell. There might be a body on, on the ground out here. Okay. Bear with me while I'm entering this in, okay? Can you see our new window for the deputy there? Yeah, I can see the deputy there. I think he's going to check the body. Okay, is there anybody else around? Uh, no, my daughter's inside the house. Okay, no, I mean outside where they I are. don't know. Should I go outside? No, sir, you just keep yourself safe, okay? I'm not advising okay. you to do anything. You just keep yourself safe. I'm just wondering what you can see from your window. I can see the deputy outside. Okay, can you see anybody else around? A deputy with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department arrived on the scene pretty quickly. Wesley was only on the line with 911 the second time for less than a minute when you can hear him say, quote, I think a deputy's here now, end quote. Patrol Deputy Michael P. Slack arrived on the scene. When I first pulled in, um, the Fensbury Drive, the south end of it is a cul-de-sac. Um, so I parked outside the cul sac and immediately upon looking in the cul sac, I saw a female, white female, <clears throat> excuse me, white female body laying in the driveway of 14108 Fensbury Drive. Did you see anything else around the female? No, there was nothing, no one moving. It was kind of eerie. As you approached the back cul de sac that you've described and, and approached and got to the position to park your vehicle, do you recall seeing anybody running from that scene? I did not see anything, anything moving, no one running. Okay. No one walking down the road or any close by streets, anything like that? No, ma'am, no one around. Do you recall seeing any cars driving fast away from that area? I did not see any vehicles. And did you see anyone standing outside their home? No, no, ma'am. At approximately 9.35 at night when you were called, tell it, or when you responded, tell us what the lighting was like in that area. The cul sac has a pretty decent lighting for the area. There's a couple street lights around there, so it was, cool. it was pretty well illuminated. Okay. And the female body that you've described, you, I believe you indicated you could see blood. 
Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what position was the body in? The body was towards the end of the driveway. Um, the head, upper body of the area was closer to the roadway itself, while the feet and were pointed up towards the garage of the residence, towards closer up on the driveway itself. So after you park your vehicle, do you go straight to this female? I do. Did you see any movement at all from the female? No, ma'am. Did you make attempts to determine if she was still alive or if you could um, do any life safety measures? I did. I, uh, I put a glove on my right hand and I went to feel for a pulse on her neck, but was not able to feel for a pulse. Did you call for EMS? I did. Okay, and then medical services? Yes, ma'am. Once you felt that there was no pulse coming from her neck, did you yourself perform any life saving measures? I did not. Okay. What observations did you make at that point once you're standing close to the body? So at that point, as I was standing close to the body, I observed a, um, a casing, a bullet casing, just next to her head, um, down towards the roadway itself. Did you move it? I did not. Did you move the body at all in any way? I did not move the body, no. It wasn't long before the cul-de-sac was flooded with law enforcement and first responders. It was determined that the victim, who would eventually be identified as Miriam Deans, was deceased. She had died of multiple gunshot wounds. Deputy P. Slack says they did a neighborhood survey. A neighborhood survey is something we'll conduct on, on both in-progress crimes and, and, and delayed crimes. For example, if I go to your house for a burglary, I'll go ahead and talk to the neighbors it depends on the, the housing situations of the residences, but I will talk to um, two to three houses down from the crime scene on each side across the street. I'm looking for stuff like a witness that saw a suspicious vehicle, cameras, um, instances, stuff like that. So I went ahead and began going around to the whole cul-de-sac. The first house they went to was obviously the house where the body was found. When they knocked on the door, Wesley was waiting for them and they asked if they could search the house. Of course, authorities don't know who the shooter was or where they went, so they check his house and make sure there are no suspicious individuals hiding inside. The only other person they find is Elizabeth, who was hiding in the master bedroom closet, watching videos on her phone. While deputies were doing a neighborhood survey, Sergeant Robert Carr had arrived on scene and was noting his findings. When I first arrived on scene, I did approach the female laying in the driveway. <clears throat> I did... Uh, observed that she did have some sort of trauma based on the blood near her head. Uh, and the call initially came out as shots were fired, so I was looking for shell casings that could be in the area, which there were two located that I did locate near her feet, which were marked after that. And while I was doing that, that is when other deputies were going door to door, checking on the welfare of all the other neighbors, and that's when I learned that there was a door open, lights were on, and nobody was coming to the door that was directly to the right side of where the body was laying at. So what happens when you approach that residence and the door is slightly open, what do you do? I did get permission for the deputies that were there knocking and announcing their presence to go ahead and enter the residence just to conduct a welfare check to see if there are any, anybody inside that may be injured. Okay. And when you say you got permission, is this from calling other supervisors? No, I made the decision okay. at that time. At that time, you were one of the supervisors on scene? Yes. Okay. Uh, prior to entering the residence, did you all make attempts to call out to see if anyone was inside? Yes, several times. Okay. And did you receive any response? No, ma'am. So tell us why you make the decision to go into that residence. Based on the initial call coming out of shots being fired, and there's a female laying in the driveway next door, that's deceased, and the door is open, lights are on, not getting an answer. You know, the safety of, of human life is our priority, so we want to make sure that everybody's okay. After clearing Wesley's house, deputies knocked on the front door of the neighboring house, but the door was partially open. Sergeant Carr believed there were exigent circumstances to enter the residence, and the deputies began clearing the house. The entire house was cleared except for a locked bedroom door near the back of the house. Not knowing what was on the other side of that door, Sergeant Carr was called over because he had experience working with the SWAT team, who would normally handle a situation where an active shooter may have barricaded themselves into a room. I initially went in based on the information given to me that there was a door that we thought to believe went into a bedroom that was locked and they couldn't gain access, so I went in to assist. 
What do you observe inside the home prior to reaching that door? Tell us what you see in the home. When I went in, I went into the left uh, kitchen table. There's a purse, a set of keys laying on the table. Uh, as I kept watching, walking toward the back of the residence, in the living room, there was the TV was on. It appeared that it could have been a movie that was on, on pause. There was a bag of, I don't know what type of potato chips in the recliner as if somebody was sitting there watching a movie. Were the and, lights on inside the home? Yes, ma'am. Did you hear anyone inside the home? I did not. See anyone inside the home? Not at that time. Okay, and, and I guess I should say, did you see any mm -hmm. alive <clears throat> people inside that home? No. So tell us what happens when you go inside regarding this locked or closed door. I'm not knowing who's inside, if anybody uh, did find a screwdriver to try to defeat the locking mechanism to unlock the door to get inside. Prior to going inside that door, do you go inside the door immediately? No. Tell us what's going on prior to entering that door. Customary, if you don't know what's on the other side of the door, you want to make sure you maintain coverage if there is somebody inside that you know, is not a friendly. So we're maintaining coverage until we decide to actually open that door that's locked. And until we decided to do it, we just hold, held our position. Okay, so when you say maintaining coverage, what do you mean? Where, where are deputies going to sort of protect everyone, residents, law enforcement, that sort of thing? The ones that are inside, there's a small hallway actually that was leading up to the door of the locked bedroom. There was a deputy in one of the bedrooms that was open. And at one point I did go in that room as well, backing up prior to going into that room. and on the other side of the wall where the recliner was in the living room, just to the right of the door. We're not going to stand right in front of the door. They don't stand right in front of the door when they don't know what's on the other side. It's a healthy strategy. Sergeant Carr used a screwdriver to unlock the door and the sheriffs entered the room. As I was able to get the door open, door open in from left to right, I immediately on the floor saw a comforter that was covering up, not knowing exactly what it was at the time. A few seconds later, I could see a gap at the bottom of the comforter near the door, and it looked like a, a human toe that was sticking out from underneath there. What did you do at that point? Grabbed a piece of that comforter and slowly pulled it back toward, down toward his waist. And that's when I uh, saw that there was a deceased gentleman laying on his back. Okay. Um, other than pulling the comforter back to confirm the appearance of a deceased body, did you move anything else in any way? No, ma'am. Move the body in any way? No, ma'am. Um, did you flip it over or anything like that? No, ma'am. Was it clear when you pulled that comforter back that the gentleman was deceased? It was clear. Could you see injuries? I saw a little bit of blood near his mouth, but I couldn't see any specific trauma. No other clear uh, bullet hole or anything like that that you could No, ma'am. And tell us what it was about him that indicated to you that he was clearly deceased. His color. Okay. At that point, when you make this observation, what do you then do? Back out of the room. As Deputy Brizzo, I believe, standing right outside of the door, I told him to maintain where he was at, not touch anything, mm -hmm. and went outside and revealed my findings. The body in the locked bedroom was identified as Robert Dean's. He was killed by a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. The medical examiner, Dr. Lesha Krostowski, said that he didn't find any defensive wounds, indicating that it was likely that Bob didn't even know that he was about to be shot. He said that Bob was likely killed about a day before Miriam. Miriam had a gunshot wound to the head and two shots to the abdomen. She also had abrasions on her forehead. Dr. Krostowski stated that any of the three gunshot wounds would have been fatal. Crime scene investigators collected evidence from the house, but the most important piece was a very faint pink fingerprint on the wall in the hallway. It turned out that the fingerprint matched Nicole, and the reason it was pink was because it had been left in blood. Even at the beginning of the investigation, before Nicole became a suspect, authorities began looking for her. She was a frequent resident of the house, the victims were her parents, and the neighbors had said that they had seen her not long before the shooting. Detective Michael Messer became the lead investigator and began talking to Miriam's family first because they were local. When family members began learning about the deaths of Bob and Miriam, they initially thought it could be a murder-suicide. 
After talking to various family members, Detective Messer was finally able to get Nicole on the phone. Hello, how is this Nathan? Uh, Amen. This is Detective Messer. I'm in the Sheriff's Office in Hester County. Um, I'm spotted, actually, if you answer. Are you okay? I just got a call from the telephone. Okay, and I was, I was just going to tell you, I, I called your uh, state to your uncle, I spoke to your grandmother, and, and um, I wanted to make sure you were okay, obviously, but I guess your uncle told you what's happened. Can you go along the hospital? Well, she's, she's not doing very well, um, but I, I needed to talk to you. If you had said that you would have been staying at your grandmother's house, um, I guess... Yeah, I, I do that sometimes, but I didn't tell her that to Oh, are you? I've been here for a couple of days or two or so. A day or two or so? Yeah, because I have school, um, Tuesday and Monday. Okay. Um, well, anyway, I can meet you up there and, uh, and talk to you. I need to show some pictures to you. Uh, and instead of being done by the movie next to Ken. Um, yeah. But you're not, you're not driving right now or anything like that. You're... Actually, I don't think I am. Oh, are you? Okay. Well, I, that's fine. I mean, I, I just want you to... Yeah, well, I'm I'm not, 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 i yeah, that's why I called me right back, though, uh, if you could, because, uh... Do you know what you No, I don't, actually. Um, and, um, are you on campus right now, Brian, or, or... Yeah, I'm on campus. Okay. Um, I really need to get, get to your dorm, uh, so try and then call me back, okay? Alright, I'll wait for you to call. Okay. Alright, thanks. Nicole initially says that she heard that her mom was in the hospital. Detective Messer doesn't immediately tell her that her mother is dead, which is not uncommon in a homicide investigation. She tells the detective that she's been in Tallahassee for the last couple of days. They discuss meeting so he can ask her some questions, and he asks her to call him back with the address of her dorm. When he doesn't receive a call back from her, Detective Messer has her uncle, Eric Lear, call her and record the phone call. Hey, so, uh, so you don't know what's going on? I don't know what's going on. Yeah, because he, he called me back, and he said that uh, your mom, uh, you know, is, is gone. That apparently something happened to your mom and she's passed away. Hey, where are Hey, I'm sorry. He's, he's making us listen to me. Are you okay? Yeah. He's making it sound like you, you, you were involved or something. I was here. Well, this, how long have you been there? Probably a day. Oh, you didn't need a, a Wednesday like you told me, Emma? No, because mom was kind of mad at grandma. Oh, when, when was the last time you were at your mom, so? I left, I left late <laughs> on the, well, I left, um, I thought I left really late on, I think, the 19th or something. Okay, can you mean Wednesday you left there? Yeah, I thought, like, really late. Was it Tuesday or Wednesday, Nikki? It was, um, it was the 19th. The 19th for sure? Or what time you left yeah. and did you leave about? Maybe 6 or 7. Right, at night? Yeah. What time of time he thinks somebody hurt your mom, uh, intentionally? Are you listening? Yeah. I mean, mom does have, I don't, I don't know, um, mom doesn't get along with, with, you know, as many people as you think. Well, who do you think would have a reason to hurt her? I don't know, um, she always had any problems with, with people at work, she said. 
Detective Messer later learns that Nicole ended up calling his office number and left a voicemail, but she didn't leave her address. It's important to note that in this phone call, she isn't exactly clear when she left Tampa. She also instantly starts putting blame on other people, and she catches herself saying she's fine, then quickly says, quote, no, I'm not, end quote. I also find it interesting that it's only been a matter of hours since Miriam was killed and Bob's body was discovered, but her uncle is already pretty suspicious of her. During his phone call with her, he doesn't seem entirely convinced when she says she left on the 19th and that she wasn't involved in the murder. Her half-brother, Joey, called her initially to find out how she was doing after hearing the news. So, you know, I started off with the normal chit-chat, you know, love you, we'll see you soon. And then she just was quiet for a second, and then she said, I'm going to miss you, Joey. Just like that? Just very matter of fact, yeah. I'm going to miss you, Joey? Yep. Yeah. Great. What did you think when you heard her say that? I didn't know what she meant the first time she said it. Um, and I don't think I made sense of it just yet. And I said, what? You know, something like, say that again or what? She's like, I'm just going to miss you. And I said, what do you mean? And then at this point, saying it out loud sounds weird, but... It, I was thinking maybe she was thinking of hurting herself because she's you know, her mom's gone. So, um, but I didn't want to put words in her mouth, and I was like, "What do you What do you mean?" She's like, "I want to say I said, are you thinking you're hurting yourself now at this point?" And she said, "No, I don't think I'd do that." And I said, "So what do you mean by that?" And then she got quiet again, and then she says, "I shot him." I said, "You did what?" Like, I shot I shot mom and Bob. I was like, and I remember leaning forward. I remember leaning forward on the couch and saying it again. I was like, what do you mean you shot my Bob? I was like, why'd you do that? Or something to that effect. And she just started crying um, really bad and talking really fast. And I couldn't understand what she was saying. I was trying to calm her down. And uh, eventually I was trying to get her to calm down and make sense of what she's saying. And... Um, Eventually, she got to the point where she was explaining that ever since she got back from um, London, her school trip, that she's had um, uncontrollable screaming in her head and like a high pitched screaming, and that um, it was affecting her sleep and she was having nightmares from it. And then um, I tried to calm her down some more, and then she said, If I had only gotten the good news phone call about the dorms earlier, if I only got the good news phone call about the dorms earlier, I wouldn't have had to do it. And I didn't know what she meant by that. I didn't know anything about the dorm situation. I didn't, I didn't know what she was meaning by that. And then she said something that I remember was, you know, um, I'm, I'm sorry I had to do it. But I'm not sorry that I did it, but I'm sorry I had to do it. Um, and then she was, you know, more crying and things like that. And then I remember thinking to myself, well, I need to, I don't know what to do now. So um, I'm going to call my family and have them help me think correctly about this. So after finding out that she wasn't going to get a dorm at FSU, she believed that she needed to kill her mother and her stepfather. It was because she heard screaming inside her head. So, okay, so she, she described um, after she shot Bob that a lot of the screaming went away in her head. It didn't go away all the way, but it went away a lot. And then she described she went up to her dorm and she was hanging out in the dorm, and she kept seeing the signs in her hallway and her stairwell saying, you know, your dreams are almost realized, keep going, things like that, like motivational posters. And she took that as a sign from God to go back and finish a job. So then she told me she went back to Tampa and she waited in the house overnight 
for my mom. And then when my mom got home, she said that she got cold feet the last second. She wanted to get out of the house. So she mistimed it. She jumped out of the window to not meet my mom. So my mom was walking in the house and she wanted to jump out of the window and just time it to where she would miss her. And she mistimed it and ran to my mom. And she said, my mom said, Nikki, what the fuck are you doing here? And she said she blacked out and somehow she knows she did it. And then I don't remember if she said she was in the car driving or she was getting to the car to drive away. Did she ever mention anything about you calling her an animal or something along those lines? Um, she said, she said, you can call me a beast, but don't call me a monster or something like that. Well, I'm going to call her a monster. It's kind of my thing. The problem with what she told her brother was, it wasn't true. She never went back to her dorm after shooting Bob. The first time she checked into her dorm was on August 21st, a little after 9 a.m. She hadn't even gotten to the school yet when she told Detective Messer she was driving around the campus during their first phone call. This was all backed up by the records pulled from her Garmin GPS and cell phone tower records. Detective Messer describes those findings. Whenever a, a cell phone a phone call is placed from a cell phone, it obviously a cell phone that is has to communicate with a network, so it reaches out to the nearest cell tower uh, to make contact, and it records that cell tower as contact. Now, when you received the records back from the from the cell phone company, were you able to? Uh, determine dates and times and potential locations of where Miss Nottingham was during that day, or at least where the cell phone was during that day, or during those days? At least the tower that the cell phone accessed, yes. All right. And on August 20th, uh, the date that um, Miss Nottingham told you and her uncle that she was in Tallahassee, uh, where, in fact, was her uh, cell phone um, pinging off of? What tower? Uh, I'd have to... Look at the records to be exact, but cell tower is consistent with the residence or the neighborhood of a residence. All right. And did you, in fact, go out and physically locate that cell tower and see that cell tower? There was two different cell towers that I located, yes. Okay. And were those cell towers in relatively close proximity to the home? Yes. And going back to the Garmin, were you able to determine uh, times and locations of where that vehicle or the Garmin in that vehicle was located during the time period uh, extending from around the time of these murders? Yes. And did those time periods and locations generally correspond with, this, with the information you received from the cell towers? Yes. The GPS also showed that Nicole's car was in a very suspicious place at the time of Miriam's murder. Now, specifically, um, with a specific time period, there was a, uh, around the time of the murder, uh, where, where was the GPS, and this is the murder of Miriam Deans, uh, where was the GPS showing that it was located uh, during that time period? It was in a, um, a neighborhood north of uh, the Deans residence. If I show you a map of the area, would, would you be able to orient yourself on it? Yes. Now, the location down here, 14110 Fensbury Drive, what is that location? That is the, uh, uh, the scene of the homicide. All right. And this, uh, this home up here, 15902 Country Brook Street, uh, do, you, do you know what the location that is? I'm trying to remember his name, but it's uh, Nicole Nachman's cousin's residence. David Lair, would that sound familiar? Yes, it is. All right. And when, during the course of the murder, um, based on the GPS proximities, where, uh, where is this location right here? What is that? Uh, that's a side street, Fox Hunt, and I believe Hound's Tooth or something like that. But uh, that is a location where the, uh, the GPS uh, from the Garmin unit was located um, Prior to the homicide. Prior to the homicide and just after the homicide, would that be accurate? Yes. All right. And just after the homicide, that GPS starts from there and starts heading up to Tallahassee. Would that be accurate? Yes. Based on your recollection of the, of the downward from the yes. GPS. Based on all of the evidence, authorities believed that this is what happened to Bob and Miriam Deans. Miriam had gone out of town for a few days in August of 2015, leaving Bob and Nicole at home. Miriam was under the impression that Nicole would be leaving to head back to school around August 19th, but when Nicole was notified that she wouldn't be receiving a spot in the dorms, she decided that she was going to murder her parents. 
Sometime around August 19th, Nicole took Bob's gun from his nightstand and used it to shoot him in the back of the head from behind. He had no idea what was about to happen to him. Nicole then dragged his body from the area outside of the kitchen, down the hall, into one of the bedrooms, covered his body with a comforter, and locked the door from the inside. She then cleaned up the floor, which was evident by the mop bucket that was still in the area by the kitchen when police searched the house. There was still blood spatter on the side of the refrigerator in the kitchen when crime scene investigators documented the house. At some point on the 19th, after the murder of Bob, Nicole went to her cousin, David Lear's house, to borrow $100. She told him that she was leaving to travel up to Tallahassee that day, but she didn't. She went back home and waited for her mother to return. At one point, Nicole learned that Miriam was concerned after not hearing back from Bob. She said that she had even sent him an email, but received no response. At that point, Nicole tried to find a way to sign into Bob's Yahoo Mail account. Well, from the download of the cell phone belonging to Nicole Nachman, um, again, I had mentioned that among records contained within the phone, it included internet searches, and there was an internet search conducted on the phone of how to reset a Yahoo uh, email uh, password. Did Ms. Nachman have a Yahoo email account? Not that I was aware. And did Mr. Deans have a Yahoo email account? Yes. And did the records actually show or indicate that uh, an email had been forwarded to her phone from that Yahoo email account belonging to Mr. Deans? Yes. And was this just prior to the murder of Miriam Deans? Yes. Nicole didn't want her mother to know that anything was wrong at the house. She wanted her to come home so she could murder her with no warning. She even moved her car a few neighborhoods over so her mother wouldn't see her distinct red Toyota Prius when she arrived home. When Miriam came into the house, something caused her to run back outside where she was gunned down by Nicole. Nicole then walked to her car that was parked nearby and drove north. At some point, she disposed of the gun, which has never been found. She eventually made it to FSU, and after checking into the Overflow dorm, she met one of the other girls who was staying there. Mariel Battle had arrived at the dorm a few days prior and was already in the room when Nicole arrived. Well, do you recall what time she was moving in? Um, maybe 9 or 10, somewhere around there, because I was eating breakfast. So it was in the morning because I had somewhere to be afterwards. And was Petra in there with you when, when you saw her? And no. And when Nicole Nutman moved in, did she talk to you at all? Um, yeah, she just introduced herself um, and what class she was in and stuff like that. All right. Um, did she say anything else to you? What, what, what class did she say she was in? I know she was an upperclassman. I'm not exactly sure if she was a junior or a senior at the time. Um, and what else, if anything, did she, t did she tell you when she saw you? Um, well, she was coming in with her stuff, and I guess I was like asking her, oh, do you have anybody there to help you? And um, she said her dad was downstairs to help her, because I was concerned because she looked like she had a lot in her hand. Okay. Um, and so, any anything else that you can remember of the conversation that morning that y'all had? Um, not at that time, because um, she was in and out trying to bring her stuff in, and then later on... Um, because I had to leave and go and meet with the, there was like a live coach meeting that I had to go to, and then I came back and spoke to her a little bit then. Okay, so you left but, for, for a while, and what did you recall about what time you came back? Um, probably around the afternoon. Um, I can't remember if it was, because there was something else in another conversation that we had, but I can't remember if it was like the afternoon after I had went somewhere or beforehand, but I do know um, she had said that she wanted me to say that she had moved in the day before. Did she tell you who she wanted you to say that to? I guess if anyone asked. All right. Did you did you find that strange? I did. I didn't see anybody asking me like that type of question, so I didn't think it was that important. All right. Specifically, she said that if anyone asked you, she was moved in the day before. Is that what you said? Yes. All right. She wanted Mariel to say that she had moved in the day before. Committing a murder and then asking someone you just met to cover for you is a surefire way to get caught. She also told Mariel that her mom had been in a car accident and was in the hospital. Detective Messer traveled to Tallahassee and questioned Nicole. The local police assisted with search warrants for her dorm and her car. They collected her GPS, 
her cell phone, and confirmed with the school that she hadn't signed into the dorm until just a few hours previously. They also spoke with Joey again, who told them about her confession. Nicole Nachtman was placed under arrest by Tallahassee police, and she immediately asked for a lawyer, so there was no interrogation. She spent the remainder of her time in the interrogation room talking about Elsa, the ice princess from the Disney movie Frozen. At Nicole's trial, her defense requested to have the murders tried separately, claiming they were separate acts, which was initially granted by the judge. This meant that at one trial, there could be no mention of the other murder. The prosecutor, however, argued that it would be impossible to introduce evidence in one case without it including information from the other. For instance, how would they introduce Nicole's statement, I shot them, into evidence without the jury knowing she had killed more than one person? The judge agreed, and Nicole was tried for both murders at the same time. This put a damper on the defense, as they were claiming that Nicole killed her mother in self-defense. They said that Nicole suffered from battered child syndrome, and she believed that she had to kill her mother in order to save her own life. I don't believe that's true in this case, but even if it was, how is that a defense against a murdering Bob? Well, for that murder, they claimed that she was suffering from schizophrenia and didn't know what she was doing at the time. So, she had a schizophrenic episode and committed murder on Wednesday, but then committed another murder on Thursday out of self-defense? Seems unlikely when you try the cases together. Now we see why they wanted to try the cases separately. Not to mention that she's never shown any signs of schizophrenia before or after this one magical episode that explained away her murder of Bob. Like most defense lawyers do, they had multiple psychiatrists in to testify to how Miriam belittled and abused Nicole, which caused her to feel so bad about herself that she thought her only answer was to kill her mother. First, they had psychotherapist Kathleen Heidi testify that Nicole suffered from battered child syndrome. She testified that Miriam badgered Nicole about her weight and appearance, called her worthless, and one time, an overweight skank. Miriam was alleged to have hit and kicked Nicole, though no family members were able to back that up. Judge Christopher Scabella only allowed the defense to argue self-defense in the murder of Miriam since there was no evidence that Bob had ever been abusive. So then, forensic psychiatrist Charles Ewing testified that Nicole showed symptoms of schizophrenia. The prosecutors had their own psychiatrist evaluate Nicole. Emily Lazarou, who you may remember from the John Johnchuk case, testified that Nicole does not suffer from battered child syndrome and revealed that the method that Dr. Heidi used to diagnose Nicole was not used anywhere else in psychiatry. Um, Dr. Lazarou, do you feel that Nicole Hoffman needs the standard for battered child syndrome? No. Right. Now, first of all, Ms. Hoffman is not currently a child, correct? Correct. And she was, was she, and she was not a child, I guess, at the time that she committed it, or this occurred. Correct. All right. Um, and what is her age now? She's twenty-five. Now, did that factor in your into your opinion on this issue? No, it didn't. Uh, Doctor Heidi used a personality development scale. Are you aware of that? I'm aware of it only because of Doctor Heidi. Okay. So, is that, is that a scale that's widely used in your field in diagnosing patients? Objection, unless he lays a, a better predicate than that. I ask you a few more questions. Um, have you ever used such a scale? No. All right. it, it is, is it taught in schools? Have you ever seen it taught in schools? No. Have you ever read about it in any magazines or anything, any uh, circular, anything uh, in, the, in the psychiatric field? Well, hopefully I would have read about it in more than a magazine, but I did look at it because Dr. Heidi was on another case that I was involved in at one time, and I did read it, about it extensively because of that. Um, and what I found out that essentially Dr. Heidi was trained by the person that actually designed it, and it was many years ago. I believe Dr. Heidi said it was about 40 years ago when she underwent her training. So that was 40 years ago. But as far as our clinical practice and somebody with as a psychiatrist in medical school and any of our training and residency, there is no training on that. I've never heard of it before, before Dr. Heidi. Dr. Lazarou also testified that Nicole had no symptoms of schizophrenia. Let me ask you this. Do you, 
Did you feel that Ms. Nodham would suffer from schizophrenia? No. Okay, why not? Because she doesn't meet the criteria for schizophrenia. All right, what does she not mean? She doesn't have any of the symptoms. The hallucinations, she doesn't have any hallucinations. I asked her directly about symptoms of consistent with schizophrenia. She denied that. I asked her about the screaming that I was I read in other reports. She denied that it was screaming. She said that it was a high pitched tone that she heard, like um like a flat line. Um, she never described any hallucinations. She never described any voices. She never described visual hallucinations. She never described delusions. I asked her specifically about those items. She did not endorse any of those, which was consistent also with the jail medical records that said she did not have any psychotic symptoms. Nicole was not reporting psychotic symptoms to me, and I asked her extensively about it because I knew it was a cause for clinical concern. Schizotypal personality disorder, as you guys know, I diagnosed her with that. And there are specific things that I look for in that diagnosis. And I specifically asked her about, do you have any types of odd beliefs? Do you think any things have special meanings to you specifically? Um, she denied that, except for to say that she thought that, you know, certain colors had certain meanings, um, like purple net royalty um, which is consistent with average people what average people think average people think that purple is royalty um, her birthstones and amethyst which is also purple so she had talked about that um, she I asked her do you feel like others talk about you trying to elicit some paranoid ideations um, and she gave me examples in reality of people talking about her she gave me an example about some kids in fifth grade that they she was singing or she was singing and, and some kids appeared to like what she was doing and then some other kids were talking bad about her behind her back and then so she said yes people have talked about me before but that is in reality that is not a psychotic symptom at all so I asked about I said do you feel that others are do you like people because that's another thing people are schizophrenic psychotic they don't really relate to others she said it's 50 50 it depends upon the person I don't like hanging around mean people so all of this stuff is reality based this is not delusions this is not somebody talking about all kinds of odd things I've evaluated thousands of people many people with schizophrenia and I have not ever had somebody that is psychotic when I'm asking these types of questions for them not to go off into something psychotic I know the types of questions to ask people to elicit those symptoms because I want to know if they have those and she did not report those she almost sounds angry that someone had diagnosed Nicole with schizophrenia just for the purpose of her defense she goes on to explain why she doesn't believe that Nicole was suffering from any delusions when she murdered her mother Yes, yeah, she did talk about saying that she felt that her mom was going to kill her. It's the whole basis for this crime. Right. Did you feel that was a delusion? No. Explain why not. I felt that it was her rationale to be able to get out of the consequences of her actions. So I thought that that was the basis of malingering, that she felt that her mother was going to hurt her, and she put that forth as the rationale for this. I did not believe that that was a delusion. So you don't believe she really, truly thought that at the time? No, I don't believe that she thought that at the time. And in fact, let me just say that uh, one of the things that sort of supported that was when I spoke with her about after she had killed Bob and... You know, because she said the whole basis for all of this was that her mom wanted to kill her. Well, I, then I asked her, or then she had said she came forward with this and just said, if my mom didn't want to kill me before, she is going to want to now, and her, right, her feeling would be justified because I killed Bob. If she had a delusion about that, she would never have said that. She would never have said, if my mom wanted to kill me before, she certainly wants to kill me now because she knows that that's not she knows that that's not the case. So she said after she killed Bob, then it was justified that her mom would want to kill her. She didn't have that thought before. She reinforces her opinion about the diagnosis of schizophrenia. She got communication from FSU 
got the hundred dollars from David, deposited that into her bank account, filled out the housing paperwork, scanned it, and sent it back to FSU between the killing of her father and the killing of her mother. The person who's suffering is psychotic, right? Maybe it'll do all well that. No. That requires executive functioning, and people with schizophrenia do not have that. They cannot plan like that. They're so caught up in their delusion, they're not in reality. So the fact that she's able to communicate with a university, come up with where she's going to get money, get money, go to the bank, deposit it, scan in an item, or fill it all out, scan in an item, send it back to university, and get housing between killing one person and killing the second person, that is incompatible with schizophrenia. She stated that Nicole had either lied or evaded questions multiple times during the course of the investigation. She lied in describing her fear that her mother was going to kill her. She lied about the date on which she killed her stepfather, where she was standing when she fired the fatal shots, and why she killed him. She also lied in her account to her brother about driving to Tallahassee and seeing posters that she interpreted as signs. The defense has Detective Messer read text messages from Miriam to Nicole in an effort to make her look like an abusive parent. You reviewed this data or this, these downloads that the Florida Department of Law Enforcement conducted, correct? On the cell phone? Yes. Yes. For the record, it's State's Exhibit 70, page 335. Can you see that? Um, the top, I'm going to refer to the message, the content of the message at the very top on the right hand side. Can you yes, read that? Yes. Can you read that for the jury? Yes. You need to weigh yourself to get an idea where you're at. At five feet, you should be 100 pounds. Add five pounds for every one inch after that. Get Bob to determine your height. And that appears, if you look to the left hand column all the way down, that appears to be a text of some sort from Miriam Deans. Is that correct? That's correct. Now I'm going to refer you to page 334 of that same extraction report. Are you able to read that, Detective, or do you need a bigger? No, that's fine. What the portion? third box, third, fourth, and fifth box beginning at, want to make sure you go back to school looking good. Okay. Beginning of that and continuing? Yes, sir. The, the next three um, entries. Okay, she replies okay, and then Miriam sends, you are 61 inches, your weight should be the max 105 pounds, keep that in mind. No meals after 7 p.m., start alternating days with salad one day and a meat the other day, stay away from breads, and she, uh, Nicole replies okay. Now, I'm not saying that Miriam was a great mother. From what some of the evidence shows, she was harsh about appearances and seemed to be a hard ass, but in no way does it seem like Nicole was a battered child. The prosecutor ends the trial by describing Nicole's real thought process. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot has been talked about throughout this trial of Nicole Nachman's thought processes, her the way of talking and the things that she said to people after this offense. I submit to you that the best evidence of Nicole Nachman's thought process are those statements on those calls less than 12 hours after she murdered her mother. She has absolutely no trouble answering the questions. His name is Detective Messer. This is the phone number I called. I left a voicemail. She gets the number back from him. She gets the address of where she is, what dorm she's staying in. She follows along in a logical manner, having that conversation with both Eric Lear and Detective Messer. That is the best evidence of what's going on in Nicole Nachman's mind closest in time to when she committed these crimes. And what does she say? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I mean, I mean, no, no, I'm not. Nicole Nachman's fine. She's fine with what she's done, but she knows that she shouldn't be. She has the thought to know I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't act like I'm fine. What else does she say? Less than 12 hours after she killed her mother, well, you know, she had a lot of people who didn't like her. She's already thought, the police are investigating me, they're on the phone with me, I gotta try and put this on someone else. Those are conscious thoughts of a murderer. 
she knows what she did and she's got to try and play it off. You know, there are people that didn't like mom and you know, mom and Robert, you know, they had issues too. These are things that she's already thought about in her mind. These are not disorganized, illogical thoughts. These are not hallucinations. At just after 1 a.m. on August 3rd, 2019, Nicole Nachman was found guilty of two counts of first-degree premeditated murder. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She will never be released. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-SAFE. 7233, or go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will instantly take your browser to a Google search page. In the event the abuser is nearby, you can assure that you don't get caught trying to get help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Be safe. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at Buy Me A Coffee or check out some of our merchandise at Teespring. You can find information on how to do that along with links to our social media at thisismonsters.com. Thanks again.